In terms of this filing that we're expecting from Uber later today, uh, given the fact that the company is not profitable, and I think there's an expectation that that'll continue to be the case for, for some time, what will be the key metrics for investors to watch, especially in light of how we've seen Lyft play out publicly? Well, I, I first have to disclaimer that uh, we invested in the company about four years ago, so I have no like, yep. new knowledge or non-public information or anything like that. Uh, I, I read the same thing you guys do or I read the things that Mike writes. Uh, that said, um, you know, the company uh, is an extraordinary company just uh, in terms of uh, where they've come from, what they've done in the time frames that they've done it. And they've blazed a path that, uh, that really hasn't been, been done here before in the Silicon Valley in terms of raising the kind of money they've raised, staying private as long as they've done it, and also going after such a large market opportunity. So it's going to be very exciting for everybody, I think, to see the, uh, the outcome here. And Mike, I know you're chronicling this in your new book, but it's pretty incredible to think about Uber potentially going public with a valuation of as much as $100 billion. Yes, I realize that could be lower than expectations based on reports we've seen in recent weeks, but it speaks to a meteoric rise. And for a company that just two years ago was incredibly scandal plagued, uh, let's talk about, I guess, that reversal and the fact that it just seems to be firing on all cylinders coming into this IPO. Yeah, it's really, it's, it is really incredible, and I think it really speaks to, honestly, something that investors and um, executives at the company have been saying since the beginning, which is, you know, Uber works even despite itself sometimes, and the product market fit really was there from the beginning. In, um, in the early days in San Francisco, when it started, uh, the founder, Garrett Camp, and, and later Travis Kalanick would want to get around the city and just couldn't, and, you know, despite the the um, the rumors of the culture and this sort of like bro mentality that a lot of the executives have had over the years people love using the product and it's a product that really works and so I think uber has been able to overcome a lot of the baggage that it's had and 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 soar back into this huge valuation Mike two years ago a lot of people probably would have said hubris is the biggest threat to uber what's the biggest threat now Sure. I think uh, a lot of investors uh, or a lot of Wall Street, you know, at this point is going to start looking at uh, the growth trajectory of this company. And, you know, for a long time, Uber was hailed as Silicon Valley's fastest growing tech company in history. You know, like everyone just started using this product from the very beginning. And, you know, Uber has been doing this thing where they're a sort of semi-private, semi-public company. They've been reporting uh, quarterly results for the past few quarters over the past year, and we're starting to see that growth uh, slow just compared to the meteoric rise from before. So now I think the street is going to want to look for what are those additional lines of business. And, and you know, we're looking at Uber Eats as one of them, uh, the food delivery business that's growing really quickly, and then Uber Freight, uh, the, the trucking management product that Uber now offers, which is also a, a large area of growth. And um, the thing that Dara Kazushahi, the CEO, is really positioning Uber as, as this sort of Amazon of transportation. So it's not a ride-hailing company, it's more a ride-hailing platform, and that means there's tons of different markets that they can enter from here beyond just the core ride-hailing business. That, that's interesting, Mike. Uh, Paul, I wonder, um, if you were trying to evaluate this as a a new stock to buy, this and Lyft, would you be most interested in those those supplemental business lines, or is this really in the end about autonomy and trying to remove the uncertainty, the expensive nature of the driver? Yeah, I think, I mean, those are, those are both very good points to look at. I think I'd step back and look overall at just a very, very simple metric, which is market size. Um, this is a thing that we discuss uh, with you guys over and over again when we look at a company like a Netflix going out and disrupting a trillion dollar media marketplace. Uh, if we look at Facebook did, which has created a, you know, hundreds of billions of dollar marketplace within social media. And then now you're in a, a company now that's going after a multi-trillion dollar transportation market. One of the things that excited investors about getting involved with Uber so early was exactly what Mike indicated, uh, an, an incredible product market fit. I mean, the San Francisco market kind of grew at this rate, and then as soon as they went to other markets, they grew like this, if that makes sense. <laughs> they grew kind of vertically, and that was fascinating. But, but this is one of these extraordinary companies that was uh, potentially going to blow up 
four or five or six multi-billion dollar businesses or disable those businesses, disrupt those businesses. Businesses like taxi, rental car, freight, delivery, ultimately the car industry itself. I mean, there are people now that are looking at the car industry and saying because of ride sharing, you know, we may have met sort of peak car ownership, at least among this demographic. So this is changing the entire way that people move things around. And the only thing you need to, to, to know to remind yourself of that is if you're an Uber user, and as I've been lucky, I've yeah. been to 63 countries around the world, you go around and you go to places that don't have it and you see how much you miss it.